Hello, boys and girls of Credit Union Land, and welcome to episode 64 of the CU Insight Experience. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Co-op Financial Services. Co-op is your trusted payments processing partner whose mission it is to drive the credit union movement forward. My name is Randy Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest of the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't find a few nuggets we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is Jill Nowacki. Jill is the founder and also the president and CEO of Humanity. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, you know that Jill is my human. This is her fourth time on the show, plus she even got to play host one time also. We've recorded some of her past episodes while we've been traveling, and Island was involved this time too. The island is in our kitchen. This conversation came from something we've been talking about a lot at home, so a couple days ago I said I think we should move it over to the podcast, and and here you go. We talked about workplace and why workplace is so important in attracting the best people to the credit union movement. We talk a lot about the recent findings from Accenture, how the perception of the workplace is so much different between the leadership and of the organization and their employees. Jill and I also talked a lot about leadership and what it means to be a great leader today. Uh, This may surprise you. As always, we wrap it up having fun with the rapid fire questions. Since uh, Jill's answered many of them before, I had a little fun with this section and mixed them up a little bit for you. Uh, I even stumped her for a minute on uh, the don't send question by having a a new one completely that she had never heard me ask before. I always enjoy my conversations with Jill. I hope I sharing this one you enjoy it too so without further ado i give you my conversation with jill nowacki enjoy jill welcome back to the show thank you i'm happy to be here that's your fourth appearance being on the podcast so i I guess you can say you are in a regular guest the only regular guest and uh (laughs) also you hosted the season one finale where you turned the table on me and i got to be the guest so we've been having a interesting conversation recently at home we're doing this episode from the the new island in our kitchen that was torn up for so many months um (laughs) (laughs) And it kind of, I guess this conversation has been sparked by the coronavirus, obviously, that everybody's talking about, but this, it really isn't about the coronavirus. We're really looking from 30,000 feet. So if you wouldn't mind, could you fill in our listeners on the conversation we've been having and on just around workplace and why it's so important for credit unions, uh, you know, to compete for that war for talent that we've talked about before. And I know a big part of this also was, you know, there's a new Accenture study that came out that you've been giving me all kinds of stats on. So <laughs> it, it, could you, could you fill the listeners in? You bet. So yes, the conversation we've been having around home is related to the workforce and changing trends on the workforce and changing demographics of today's workforce. And a lot of this ties together, this idea that employers need to trust their employees and build a culture where people feel empowered. And part of this came from a conversation we've been having in general about the idea of working from home or working remotely. And part of this came from the Accenture, the Getting to Equal 2020 report that just came out. That was wild. And uh, what it says in that report is that it points to some statistics and it talks about this idea that a culture of equality and empowerment really matters. And it, employees say that they need that in order to thrive in the workplace and fra to 75% of the youngest generation of workers says that. So it's a trend that as we see our youngest employees age up and grow, we can only expect that employee expectations of equality in the workplace and a culture of empowerment in the workplace those expectations are just going to rise and become more important. Something, I mean, it caught my attention seeing the article when uh, just the title of it, that the the difference between, I guess, what employers think or managers or leaders think compared to what employees think when it comes to the workplace flexibility. The, could you talk more about that? Yeah. So when I'm working with clients, a big part of what I talk with them about is that the perspective at the top of the organization and the perspective at the bottom of the organization, they may be very different 
It doesn't mean either is wrong, but we typically allow our narratives be, to be shaped by those in power. So this Accenture report is interesting. Two thirds of leaders, so 68% of leaders are like, we create empowering environments. And less than one third or just about one third of employees actually feel like they work in empowering environments. So that's a pretty big gap. It's a huge gap, right? <laughs> like that, that was the part that blew me away just to see that gap. But I guess it shouldn't be that surprising, right? You know, I mean, I know in your work and that's something that, you know, we've talked quite a bit about is there is that perception change. You know, there, there's a couple of things I really w wanted to, to touch on here. And I've not only have I obviously seen the work that you've been doing for the past year, but you've actually helped see you insight with our last two hires. You, you, we did the national search for both of them. You know, my newest colleagues, we have our CEO, Lauren, who was on the podcast. Obviously, we did a, a, a big search to find her and find that perfect fit. And then, and then more recently, Jackson from South Dakota. So, you know, where everybody a few years ago was basically in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm now up here in Connecticut. We have Lauren in Wisconsin. Jackson's in uh, South Dakota. We still have John and Robbie in South Carolina. Dave's in Florida. You know, it's, it's that spread out team. And we've seen the benefits, I guess you could say, firsthand from a flexible workplace. Um, one of the things I've heard you mention before a lot when we're talking about credit unions in the workplace is trust. Could you talk about how trust comes up in the conversation you have with credit unions? And, and as an add-on, why is that lack of trust maybe hurting organizations? Yeah. So that we just talked about this idea of organizations really it really mattering to employees to be able to work in an empowered environment and about this idea that leaders think they provide that, but employees don't necessarily feel that. And so in a quick example that comes to mind of a place where a leader is saying, well, we trust our people and they're empowered, but then the employee makes a mistake. And so with, what happens when that mistake may occur. And a place where this authenticity gap can enter is if the employee makes a mistake and then they get in trouble for it or they get punished for it, the employer may still be thinking, well, I gave them the latitude to try. The employee is now thinking, you didn't trust me enough to trust my intent was good and to coach me into a place rather than reacting in a punitive way to me. So the next time that employee has a chance to, to take a risk, there is an incredibly decreased likelihood of them stepping out and trying something innovative if their experience is that they get in trouble if it doesn't go perfectly. It's so interesting to hear you say that because I, as a listener of the podcast also, so many people in the first season of the show talked about that big mistake they made earlier in their careers or at work. And almost to a person who had success later becoming CEOs, they talked about not getting beat down by it, but where it was almost like the their leader at the time was like, okay, you know, you were trying, you, you know, like, but how are we not going to do that again? How do we learn from it? How do we fix it? I remember, you know, former colleague of yours, Tom Kane, when he was on the show, right? Like talking about like when there is a problem coming with a solution, at least one solution to the problem. Um, do you have any hacks, I guess, or any tips that you would give from a leadership standpoint to the leader who's like, ah, oh, but that person screwed up? Yeah. Like, and, you know, take a deep breath. What's <laughs> <laughs> Always. Right? There's, there's great power in deep breaths. But um, there's a Harvard Business Review article, and the article is probably pages long, but there's really one outcome to it. And if a leader can remember to do this every time, it will change exponentially the interaction with the employee. And it's it's the difference in this. When you catch an employee doing something wrong or an employee comes to you and tells you something went wrong, there is a tremendous difference between what were you thinking and what did you learn from that? Uh -huh. Either one is still going to, well, I, I guess I can't say either one is going to get you into that conversation because what were you thinking can shut it down pretty fast. <laughs> um, but, but it can get you into a conversation where you know that the employee understands why they wouldn't do that again. <laughs> right. That, no, that makes a ton of sense. When you look at credit unions from the 30,000 feet level, are, are there a few things that we could all be doing better to improve our workplace and make credit unions, uh, you know, that more desirable place to work? There are many. And I think often with credit unions, we're really quick to say, well, we can't, you know, flexible work environments aren't a possibility for us because we need tellers who are here from nine to five when our members walk in. And the reality is there, there may be ways to provide greater flexibility and increase the autonomy that an employee might have. And you know, I've heard credit unions talk a lot about 
seven month tenure for teller positions, and there's a lot of turnover in that. I've heard them sort of raise the idea and rather quickly dismiss thoughts about like, what if you had a bank of tellers shared among organizations, and it was part of a job training program where those employees could be called upon similar to how the gig economy works, and a teller could go take the tellering job to the degree that they want to, but also perhaps have the flexibility to continue going to school during certain hours of that. And because it's almost a shared job program, could that increase that flexibility? Is that a way credit unions could be appealing employers for a younger workforce or a workforce that demands greater flexibility? So something like that, would that be something like a individual credit union would do among their branches? Or would that be something that you see like cooperation among cooperatives, like, you know, credit unions in an area all setting up this pool of talent? I not all credit unions would have the sires to be able to support that. There's certainly, you know, if credit unions can do shared branching, which right. we've right. demonstrated the capacity to do, credit unions could do this shared employee pool. That's a pretty cool idea there. I've not, I've not heard of that. So if you break out the crystal ball for me, if we were to sit down, say, one year from now, I know we'll sit down before then. <laughs> <laughs> if we were to sit down a year from now, um, what would you like to see credit unions doing better? I mean, something that we could, let's call it a short term success to help build, you know, to that longer term success of having very desirable workplaces. I want to see credit unions source talent differently. And please tell, <laughs> please tell me more. I am. Um, <laughs> Too often, I think we have used the same practices at every level in our credit union industry for recruitment. And so you end up in later careers where people talk about how they stumbled into their credit union career and their credit union job, or you end up with, you know, talent that was found from the same pool where you found your last employee from. And that continuing to source talent the same way we've always sourced talent continues to perpetuate homogeny and sameness in the industry. So in order to position credit unions really as destinations of choice, being more intentional in where we're looking for talent and looking outside of where we've always looked before, that would be a huge change that I'd be excited about. So this was not a question that I sent you beforehand, but I'm going to tee up humanity right now. How is humanity changing that? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Through a lot of intentional work, partnerships and exploration into different areas that we are seeing be successful in producing different types of thinkers and different types of leaders. That kind of goes into my last question in this section. And and I would be remiss if I didn't bring up uh, diversity, equity and inclusion, uh, having you on the show. So when we've talked about workplace, when we're talking about, you know, on past shows, you've talked about bringing your whole self to work, you know, to wrap up this, this first part, is there anything that you'd like to do to, to bring workplace and DEI and you know, recruiting kind of all back together into, you know, one nice little package? Hmm. Yeah. All of this talk about what the workplace needs to look like and a culture that is empowering, it all ties into the DEI work. The purpose of building an inclusive culture is to create a place where every individual can bring their greatest strengths and talent. So when we expand the diversity, you know, make it so that employees who are successful in our organization don't have one look or one background or one way of thinking. And that instead, it's clear that leaders can come from all walks of life and all levels of experience and all different backgrounds. Then we start to build toward that place where people feel increasingly comfortable showing up as their whole selves because they recognize that they don't have to put on a certain way of behaving or attempt to assimilate to a certain type of thinking in order to fit into that organization. And that's where we move toward innovation and empowerment and just better ideas. I, I know that's something we've talked a lot about, you know, since you, you started humanity. So I, I'd like to move into the leadership and life hacks portion of the show. I've added some new questions and tweak some others since you've been on the show before, but I, I still uh, think that there's some important stuff here that we can kind of dig deeper into. For, for those who may have missed one of the past episodes, you should go back and listen. Um, <laughs> it, it, could you tell our listeners what inspired you to, to start humanity last summer? 
I love credit unions. I've loved credit unions since I stumbled into them in 2001 as my first uh, career out of college. And I believe that credit unions have an absolutely critical place in our economy to expand the economic capacity of communities and the members they serve. I believe that credit unions have a permanent relevance and an absolute obligation to people you know, throughout time and will. I also think that if credit unions don't get their talent right and continue to bring in the people who can lead sort of the nobility of this movement we have forward, then we may miss out on that continued relevance that we need. So the reason to start Humanity was because there needed to be some intentional, strategic, system-wide effort focused on human capital solutions. And when I was working as a league president and trying to make referrals, I didn't know a firm out there that was this focused on strategic human capital. And I felt like it needed to be done. As uh, Tim Ferriss would say, scratch your own itch, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's been so interesting to me watching you grow this in the response that's come from the credit union uh, community because we hear so much talk about disruption and, you know, how fast the pace of change and technology and all of that type of stuff. But when you bring it back down to people, you have to have the people, right? So yeah. it's something that's really, it's been so much fun to watch. Now that you've had some time on the job, it's, you know, kind of closing in on a year almost. Uh, how, how, how has the inspiration changed with the time on the job? I think that the work feels more important to me today than it did when I set out to do it. Uh, that's pretty I, awesome. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I love it. I am having so much fun with it. And the interest that has come from all different areas of the industry coming forward and saying, we want to address this. We we want to make this right. And we need a little support in it. It just makes me recognize how absolutely valuable it is and how much there is to do. And it's so exciting to see the appetite that the industry has for it, too. Yeah, that has been cool. I always ask the question about what your leadership style is. And you've answered that before. But I, I think now looking back, I was like, have you had to adjust or what does your leadership style look like now that you're trying to create something from scratch? <laughs> this humanity didn't exist this time last year. So this is such a funny question because right now, as you know, I've been going through this certification so that I can do a very specific type of predictive analytics and and coaching. And I had to administer the test to myself as part of the study tool. So I have a an increased level of like educated awareness around, around where I have challenges. And um, one of the areas that I'm really proud of about myself is that I have a tendency to be very collaborative and open-minded. And along that same paradox, there is a tendency I may have to uh, perhaps not exert myself with enough certainty. And when you're building a business from scratch, you have to be, to borrow a, a word from our friend Sam, you have to be audacious in that. You, <laughs> you have to be bold. You have to be certain with that. And so I've definitely noticed where it doesn't come naturally to me and where I've had to lean into that certainty and be more, more forthright. I think that's not only in for those of us that have either built a company or are building a company, but I think even when you're trying to get a new project or initiative or anything like that off the ground, that's something to be aware of, right? Like is, is how do you, how do you push the bar forward uh, in an organization? So as a leader, is there something that your team at Humanity has heard you say so many times in this past year, they, they can finish your sentence? I don't know. I probably the, we are here to help build workplaces that work for today's workforce. And so that idea of really creating, you know, focusing on we are credit unions best ally in the war for talent. We are here to make workplaces work for today's workforce. Yeah, I've heard you say that. And the <laughs> funny part of what just happened while Jill was answering with that is I, our dog started whining and I had to go put him in the other room, but I was still listening the whole time. So, uh, <laughs> so I say, um, this, I, I didn't want to stop the recording. You seem to be on a roll. Uh, th 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 this is a question uh, that I added since the last time you were on the show. I, sometimes as a leader, you know, we have to make those 
decisions that maybe people don't like in the short term. I know this has come up at in times in your career. Uh, I'm sure it has in the past year, you know, while you've been building humanity, that unpopular decision that you view as for the greater good. How is that something that you've cultivated in yourself to, you know, make the tough decision? So this is an area where I'll I'll go back to reference that paradox again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the level of openness I have to hearing from others, sometimes that creates a, I, I may be slower to a decision because I'm collecting a lot of information and a lot of feedback. I do believe that that helps me be more confident in the decisions I make. And it helps me make more informed decisions because they do have more perspectives than just my own when I make them. So if I get to a point where I'm making a decision that's unpopular, by the time I've gotten there, I'm really able to articulate the why behind that decision, the value I expect to come from that decision, and also to articulate what I understand about the risks or the the pain that may be caused by that decision that too. could cause some others in the short term. So you're a human capital pro. <laughs> What's the one common myth about being a leader that you would just love to debunk? I want people to understand that there is no one type of right leader. There is no picture of what a leader looks like. There are many different people, many different styles that can be very effective in leadership. And not just from a situational leadership perspective, but from a that that not every leader needs to look the same in order to be incredibly effective. And not every leader needs to be communicating in the same style or shaped by the same perspectives to have gotten to that point. You know, something I know we've talked about quite a bit over the past year is that idea of like adding qualifiers to, you know, like if it's CEO, everybody out there can think of what the first image that comes to mind when you hear the word CEO. There doesn't need to be the qualifiers around it. So I, I know that is uh, it's been the part of many conversations. Um, <laughs> you work with credit unions and organizations from coast to coast. Is there a mistake that you see leaders making or one maybe that even you made early in your, your career that you could share? I think a lot of uh, early in their career leaders make the mistake of trying to act in a way that they think a leader looks like. Okay. And so it becomes a, you know, oh, I'm I'm not going to joke around with my team because I'm in charge and they need to be. And, and they may lose some of their human nature in an effort to try to be a leader. And the reality is that I think as we get further into our career, we recognize that that human vulnerability can be a tremendous strength as a leader. Yeah, and it's quite honestly, it's what got us there, right? So, right. Or, or, you know, being authentic. I have a, a friend who told me a story once about how she was you know, this vibrant, incredible personality at her credit union. And she got promoted to a vice president position. And as soon as she got promoted, she started to wear a lot of gray. And, <laughs> and, and the CEO had to pull her aside and say, that is not what got you here. Stop it. So, <laughs> she, really went to, she went to the funeral side of the closet the whole time, right? Like, geez. Um, <laughs> when, when, when you think back over the past year, did you receive any advice or a life lesson that, that you find yourself kind of going back to over and over? Goodness, I should have been prepared for this question. Um, <laughs> just like over just the last year. Oh. I mean, you can go further back. Is there something that you've brought with you that's maybe resurfaced in the past year that you're like, you know? So I, in my, I think my first appearance on the podcast, I referenced this piece of advice that Tracy Kenyon had given me and it was the let the chips fall advice. And it is the like persist, go through, make your best effort and just let things land where they do. And where I guess that has translated recently is I recognize that part of the reason I got that advice from Tracy was because she trusted me and I deserve to trust myself with that same level of trust. And so to be able, as I'm building out this company and I'm introducing new business lines and new products and services, the reason why I think these are good ideas is because of a of an informed place I'm coming from and that I should be trusting myself and, and pushing forward and letting the chips fall on how these come out. 
fall where they will. Another thing that I noticed uh, a lot in the first season was how important mentors were in, in many of the guests' lives. Uh, you you and I have talked a lot about this also. Um, you just mentioned Tracy. Do you, do you have mentors who have helped shape you into the leader you are today? And, you know, a couple add-ons to that. How have you benefited from these relationships? And, and I know this is a, you know, a network that you're trying to create on a national level. So it, nobody better to speak on mentors, I think, than you. But why is this so important? So I was speaking at a conference last summer, and I made the comment that if you've met me, you've probably mentored me. And it made people laugh a lot. <laughs> um, so but the, the point I was making is that there is so much to gain and to learn from everyone who we cross paths with. And I've been so fortunate to meet so many smart leaders and brilliant people who have been willing to to share with me parts of their journeys and their lessons learned. And so I, I'm not convinced that every mentoring relationship needs to be kind of that formal, like, are you my mentor? But I see tremendous value in those. And I am a huge believer in mentoring from a formal perspective because of a statistic that I came across that says that for the best way for a woman to get promoted, earn more money and to advance in her career is to be mentored by a white man. And so that idea led me to kind of follow this path of what is it that that she's getting in that case that's making her be more effective. And the realization is that it's a different way of looking at problems. It's access to a different network. And it's a it's sort of that encouragement to self-advocate differently. And so if we can create relationships, and I believe there's value in going both ways with these relationships. But if we create relationships that provide different access, that create different perspective, and that encourage bold moves, then that's a great way to see all of us rise up. Yep, I am with you there. I added this question this year, and you've 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 heard me ask it, and I, I talked to you quite a bit about it before I put it into the podcast. It, what, but was there ever a point in your career where you just felt lost in what you were doing? Uh, you know, had that self doubt. And what advice do you have or how did you work your way through it? And do you have advice for other people who maybe I think most of us hit that at some point, right? And so I don't know if this exactly answers the question you're asking. But as you know, it was a really difficult decision for me to leave a a good job as the league president in Connecticut and go do something that seemed risky. I talk a lot today about this idea of needing to see better representation of women and people of color in these key leadership positions in the industry. And one of the key leadership positions I talk about is league presidents. When I became a league president, there were more league presidents named John than there were female league presidents. The numbers, there are still far fewer than 30% of the league presidents are women. And so I was making a choice to to make those numbers worse, essentially, right. yeah. by walking away, right? I was stepping out of one of these key leadership positions and stepping into something completely different. I eventually came to a place of confidence about that decision by because I believe that what I'm doing today is going to change those numbers more significantly than my presence in one of those positions did. How I had to get to that place, though, was really working working through my why and really focusing on what is it that I care about, what is the best way I can live my personal mission, and what is the best way I can put my values to work. So the advice I would give to somebody else in that situation is, you know, is that self-doubt, is that feeling of stuckness coming because you're not living consistently with your values, with your mission, with kind of what your highest calling or the greatest contribution you can make is? Uh, be your authentic self, right? <laughs> Come on. Uh, <laughs> uh, what is that? I, I was going to have fun with this one, actually. So uh, <laughs> what does your typical work day like look like for you? And uh, since we both now work from home, a part of the time, I guess, I sh- when we're not on airplanes uh, and, and the add on, what does that perfect work day look like for you today? 
That's so tricky because it's a kind of like I want a column A and a column B, right? So the typical work day at home versus the typical work day on the road. Honestly, from either perspective, my perfect work day, I love being with clients. I love working with my credit unions or the trade associations and being there with the teams and really diving into that work of what can we do to create a culture where every person who's here can be contributing at a higher level. So the days that fly by are the ones where I'm I'm on site with a client. I have my my typical day if I'm at home involves a lot of time on the phone, it seems. So a lot of time talking about the value of humanity, the work we're doing, sharing the story and an occasional sidebar conversation with my co-working er um, <laughs> about me. whatever else might be going on in the industry too. <laughs> It seems to be a lot of uh, video conferencing as well. I always have to make sure I'm not walking around behind you or something. So, <laughs> yeah. Not only did Gary get the cameo appearance on today's podcast, right. he also got one in a video call yeah, I had the other day. That's, <laughs> yeah, that is the joy of working from home. The dog, me, the UPS person ringing the doorbell. Uh, so <laughs> inside or outside the credit union movement, is there an accomplishment that you've had that when you look back on it, it just makes you smile and you say, I did good. I'm proud of that. You know, uh, I made a difference. I'm, I'm grateful that I got to have that experience. This may be a, a, a recency effect because it's a conversation that I had at the GAC with the CEO of MAPS Credit Union. And that, of course, is I worked for MAPS before I was the league president in Connecticut. And Mark Zook and I were talking about the MAPS Community Foundation, which was one of my projects that I started when I was working there at MAPS. And as Mark and I were talking about it, he was talking about the growth that foundation has, the goals it has today, the contributions it's planning on making in the community. Last month, they hired a full-time executive director for that. So this little, this, you know, cute little baby foundation that I started with big visions for, and, and I passed along and said goodbye to you when I went and took another job. It's a, I'm so grateful and so excited that it's something that has so far outgrown that little seed I've planted and that that organization has continued to nurture and cultivate that and leave, given me a chance to leave a, a legacy that is so much greater than what I put into it. That's pretty cool. And I know um, when I saw you after you had the conversation with Mark, you were pretty lit up. So that's always a good thing. Uh, before we move on to the last part of the show, you've answered this question before, but I, so I want to take a little bit of a different twist on it because many people, we've talked about workplace and flexibility and things like that. But if, if you have a free day, there's nothing on the calendar. Let people know what your passions are outside of you know credit unions, but also, you know, over this past year where work and home are under the same roof, uh, you know, wh what do you do to recharge and, and what does work life integration look like? Not only working from home, but also being on the road with credit unions a lot and, you know, the, the associations and speaking and all the, the good stuff you're doing. Well, it's no surprise that you're a big traveler. And I think even though I'm on the road a lot for work, that that travel from a more recreational or adventurous perspective continues to be my favorite way to disconnect and recharge. And I maybe I was scuba certified before our last one. I don't remember, but um, certainly the the chance to go and get certified and then the time that we've spent on that and the the um just the joy i've found in that that different experience of exploring this whole part of the world that most people don't get to see has been a pretty amazing addition to my recreational behavior this past year and it's tough to think about anything else when you're underneath the water right so it's, uh, my dive instructor told me it's impossible to think negative thoughts when you're underwater try it sometime and i always forget to try it but at some point i'm going to try to be negative because the, the thoughts are so positive once <laughs> yes, you're under there right. it's just so amazing right like uh, it's one of of the things that I'm going to pat us on the back that I'm proud of is, you know, both of us are extremely busy and we travel for work quite a bit, but to actually, you know, months in advance, we will block out time that we still make sure that personal travel is there and, and put that in a priority and that time for us to recharge and reconnect together as well and with Crosby. So I think we're doing good at that. So <laughs> uh, the, the third part of the show, the rapid fire questions, as you know, the questions are rapid, but your answers do not have to be. So, I didn't, I've never asked you this question before on the show, but what were you like in high school? And, and do you remember that first time you got in memorable trouble? I was 
busy in high school. I, <laughs> that doesn't shock yeah, me. Yeah, right? I, don't, I was probably busier then than I am now. I just did a lot. So I was, I was very active. I did you know, cross-country dance team, student council. So I kept really busy. And I guess because of that, there really wasn't much time to get in trouble. It probably helped that my dad was the vice principal in charge of um, attendance at the school and also the football and wrestling coach. So he knew all the boys and um, that kept me probably from from having too much room to get into trouble. <laughs> uh, Gordy was always there. It, always. <laughs> always. <laughs> so, uh, you know, most of us, and you, you kind of mentioned uh, it earlier about you know stumbling into a career in credit unions, and, and most of us have done that in one way or another. What did you want to be when you grew up? So I was just telling your mom that this weekend. <laughs> we were in a conversation about it. And when the, the first career I remember really wanting was to be a youth psychologist. And and uh, the funny thing about it was that when I told m- your mom that... I did not know that. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> surprise me. But, uh, she was like, that's kind of what you do now as far as the work in coaching and kind of trying to get into the the mindset of people and, and helping them come to solutions. I thought, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> They're just a little taller. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so any uh, new daily routines that you, you have to do or any daily routines you just would like to share that you do that and if you don't do it your day just feels off i had such a good run for meditation i think i was like 130 days of meditation it was impressive then i got a cold and we went to iceland where it was dark all but five hours a day and i lost my meditation i didn't know when it was morning i guess right, so, right. <laughs> when, are you, when are you supposed to meditate i lost my i lost my stra- streak and now i've had a hard time getting back into it but um i you know march is my birthday month and so it's a good time for renewal and rejuvenation and i'm ready to pick back up my routines now (laughs) so since you've already answered the best album of all time question and i know the the first time you were on the show that was the only question that pretty much gave you any stress (laughs) so uh how about sharing with our listeners do you have a, a favorite movie or Maybe a fun question. If you were stranded on a desert island and you only had one type of wine, what would it be? I, uh, mine won't be a Corona that I'll bring with you since we're on a desert <laughs> island, but uh, I'll find my beach. Uh, mm, so if I'm on a desert island, I'm going to assume it's a nice hot day and we've got beautiful, perfect weather. And I think a really nicely chilled rosé sounds like a great <laughs> option for that. Awesome. <laughs> do, do you have any books that recently you've been telling everybody about or recommending? And, or, you know, maybe one that you think everybody should be reading right now? I'm going to do two, but I'm going to do them quick. So me and white supremacy has been a really interesting activity <laughs> uh, for me. It's a 28 day journey. I know you wish I'd throw a book cover on it when we go out in public. And because if you don't get close enough for the subtitle, it becomes a little questionable as Absolutely. far as what it means. Yeah. But, it, that's um, a, that's, I, th- I think there have been some looks on airplanes. <laughs> it, so. uh, that's been a fantastic exercise and just really eye opening about how much I have to learn about the areas where I have privilege. And then um, Ohio, which is is a novel <laughs> is uh, interesting and engaging, but also just from the perspective of as as an aspiring writer, the beauty and the craft of that author's work was so intriguing to me. It's probably the only book that I finished and then thought, wait, I want to go back and start it again and read it just from the perspective of the work that he did to tell that story. Yeah, well, I, I didn't let you go right back and read it because you <laughs> passed it on to me and I could not put it down. I think I finished it in less. <laughs> in a week. So (laughs) that was an amazing book. I recommend everybody reading that as well. Has anything become more important for you in the past year? And and what, if anything, has become less important? I hesitate to say it's become more important because since he was born, Crosby has been incredibly (laughs) important to me. But this past year and the, the change structure and then also you know, he's almost nine now. And so he's he's growing up more and becoming more and more of this little human who actually becomes more fun to be around. So making sure that I am getting the right kind of time with him is increasingly important as he gets older. What's become less important? I don't know everything this I still go back to that kind of the the probably the biggest difference between you and me is you're the whole if it's not a hell yes it's a no and I'm like if it's not a hell no it's a sure why not like (laughs) I still maybe haven't gotten that right filter down about the things I should say no to or stop doing it's it's just like high school it's fun to do it all like I love it (laughs) you need more hours uh 
So there, there's a question that I don't send that you absolutely know because you've been asked it and you hear me ask it all the time. So I've changed it up a little bit for you and I didn't send this over to you. So I'm going to put you on the spot because that's always a fun part of the podcast. So when you hear the word success, what's the first workplace that comes to mind? Oh, my goodness. I, yeah, I'm <laughs> scrolling through thinking you're you're not being serious and that you didn't really surprise me. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, Who's doing it well? Right now, I can't not think about the the Accenture survey that I read today, and I I think that I will talk about Sodexo because they have a case study in that new report that came out. And what I admire about that particular case study is that it was an organization that said, "Wow, we're really far from perfect right now. Let's set some really clear metrics and let's let's be really specific in who we hold accountable and move toward that." And so. While that's the company name that's coming to mind, the idea behind it is that the successful organization is the one that can say, we're not perfect, but we're willing to take actions and set metrics and hold people accountable to move toward that. We measure everything else, right? So we have to measure that too. Thank you again, Jill, for being on the show and sharing your story today uh, and also allowing me to put our conversations out on this podcast. Uh, um, I, I greatly appreciate it. My last question for you, do you have any final asks of our listeners today or final thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, so we uh, we had some fun today in our podcast, and I I think it was a, it was a pretty lighthearted approach to it. But I I guess I just want to say that I recognize that diversity, equity, and inclusion work it's it's tough work, it's hard work, and it's hard because many of us are still learning. And as we learn more, we realize how much we've gotten wrong or how much more we have still to learn. And so my ask is just that people remember that like anything in life, perfection is not a prerequisite to doing this and to getting started with it. So the ask is start where you are, grow from where you are, then learn more. You know, equality is for everyone, not just everyone getting an opportunity, but everyone getting involved and working toward it too. Ah, that's a beautiful way to wrap everything up. We will link to everything we talked about today in the show notes. Best way for people to get in touch with you if they have additional questions. You're at Jill now on Twitter, at Humanity on Twitter. I know you're on LinkedIn. Email. What's your? Do you have a preferred flavor? Uh, my preferred ask for a, a real specific questions or specific outreach is email, and that's Jill at Humanity dot com. If you send me a message through LinkedIn, I'll send you my email address and ask you to send it to me by email. So, <laughs> so cut that. Down. And just go, uh, just go straight to email. It just comes straight to the source. Uh, well, thank you again, Jill. I, this was absolutely fun and amazing as always. And I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You too. Before we go, I want to send out a big thank you to you for listening. I I wouldn't be able to have this much fun doing what I do if if you all weren't tuning in. So thank you. And once again, I'd like to thank Jill for taking the time out of her busy schedule and for allowing me to share our conversations with all of you. And finally, a big thank you to our sponsor, Co-op Financial Services. Make sure to, to click on their link in the show notes, show them some love and see everything they have going on. One last thing is an ask I have of all of you. We're on all the podcast players out there, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. We would greatly appreciate if you subscribe. And if you could leave us a five-star rating and maybe even better a review on the old Apple podcast machine. Uh, It helps with the visibility of the show and us spreading this uh, credit union love. If you don't think we're worth the five stars, forget I asked and just reach out to me directly and let me know how we can improve. Always looking for feedback. And, And don't forget about the See You In Insight Experience podcast book list to get your next book delivered right to your door with from the recommendations of the thought leaders on our show. Thank you all again for listening and have a great day. 